Okay, thank you very much for this introduction, John. I didn't expect that you mentioned my optics past because I always say that I'm retired from physics. Uh, but anyway, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you all to stay with us till the last session. I, I was expecting maybe less people, but I, I see that there is a lot of people that is uh, wondering what, what's my talk about, because that was the surprise. There was no title in the program. And I, I, when I was asked to do this talk, I was thinking, okay, probably to be the last, uh, everything has was already been said. Uh, even as you'll see at the, at the end of my talk, some images are already being used. So it was difficult to say, well, what I'm going to talk about. So I, I was thinking that maybe it could be a good idea to talk about uh, openness in global. And it could be a good idea to bring to the past something that was uh, yet another declaration, as some people always say, wow, another declaration. A declaration that really was inspiring me for me in uh, when it appeared a decade ago. It's a, a, a hidden declaration that probably most of you don't know because now I'm gonna ask you, please raise your hand who has ever read or has notice of the Wheeler Declaration. So it's perfect. Nobody knows about the Wheeler Declaration. So now I have time to explain you. You, well, you are always an, uh, an advantage uh, student and you know everything, Raymond. <laughs> but okay, so why I chose the Wheeler Declaration? Well, it's not because of this man, Benjamin Eid Wheeler. Uh, the second question is, who is this man? I don't know if any, any of you is from California? Yeah. yeah? But you are from Stanford? No, well, you, you're there. Uh, well, he was uh, the president of the University of California in the, 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 the president in that uh, period, 1899 to 1999. But the declaration is not from him, and it's not named after him. It's named after this building. Maybe if you've been in Berkeley, you know this building. Well, this is the Wheeler Hall, of course, and that's why the declaration is named the Wheeler Declaration. Well, we have to go back to 2008. So it's, let's go back and have a, a travel to the past. What happened in 2008? In 2008, PKP was 10 years old already, so there was a lot of things down there, but there were a lot of things also going on in the sphere of openness. The BOAI, I understand that many of you know what it means, but it's the Budapest Open Access Initiative was already six years old. Well, in fact, the meeting was in December in 2001, so it was almost seven years old, the discussion. The publication was in February, so that's why six years old. So well, there was already some discussions about all the green and the gold and all these uh, roads that we are still discussing on that. What else? Do you remember the MIT OCW, uh, the f open course were, uh, well, they were already six years old. Uh, and, in, and in Spain, there were a lot of universities embracing this initiative, the open course where we all, oh, if the MIT is doing the open course where we must follow them. Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to discuss now about that, but I think that we were, in fact, the second country with more open courseware. I don't know where are they now. I, I know that some of them, they are still there, and I still see some universities uh, following this path. But the MIT open courseware was like the inspiration, and we follow it. CC license were already six years old. In fact, they were turning six years old uh, next in a few weeks, they, are, they will be turning 18 years old, so it's not too bad. Okay, a lot of things happened in 2002. I don't know what, what was, why, why everything in 2008 were six years old. But let's go back to 2008, because 2008 also was another anniversary. The anniversary of the Cape Town Open Education Declaration. Huh? Have you heard about that? Because if not, we could also discuss about the open edu this open education declaration that was not successful as the open access. And, and I remember we had this uh, a debate on this declaration the year before in 2007 uh, when we had a meeting in Dubrovnik and we were uh, discussing in an educational panel, maybe we need a declaration to maybe have more policies and all that. And well, 
it happens to be this open education declaration that was not either successful as others. But we could just keep going, what's gone, what happened in 2008, what happened. Well, my, my library was something like that. That was the web page. Uh, there is a fantastic tool in internet, the Wayback Machine, and you can go to the Wayback Machine, just put the, the, your uh, URL and you see how it looked. And I found out that at that time we were also celebrating another wheeler, but there was as a physicist, and it was not even because I'm a physicist, but we had an exhibition in the library about a wheeler, that not relatives with the, the rector or the president of, in California. We had here also already uh, our institutional repository, and we also had already the, the Office of Knowledge Dissemination. In fact, we started in 2006. And it's nice to see that here you have a lot of memories and you remember here that, well, we had already uh, some uh, space for open access. We had some uh, page on open access. Uh, we had already, the, the, that page was licensed under CC license. Well, I was behind the page, so I had to be coherent. And we were celebrating the open access day. In 2008, there was no open access week. There was only one day, the open access day, the 14th of October. And afterwards, we celebrate the open access week. So, and, and here also we have a, a, an interesting thing that the first PhD thesis and the CC license in this consortia that we have in the, the Catalan uh, University Services. So that was the first one under the CC license. So you, we have a lot of memories from 2008. So it was supposed to be a, a good year. Also, in 2008, I met uh, all these people. That was my first contact with the public knowledge project, with Kevin. We were there in Trieste, and we were engaging with people from the development countries, talking about open access. And I remember you sharing some CDs with the uh, op open journal systems, because they couldn't have a really good internet connection. And I remember bringing those CDs to my library and say, well, we must do that. We must install that. It's a pity, Kevin, that you missed the picture because I don't see you. Maybe you, were, you came later, but I, that was really a, a good meeting and, and a good uh, experience to talk with all these people. Leslie is here, Irina is, are, is here, and so there's a lot of, of people. But let's go back. Let's go back to, to Berkeley in 2008 and why I chose the Wheeler Declaration. Well, in that, in that building in October, I don't know what happened now here, but in October, two, uh, the 11th of October of 2008, there was this meeting of the free culture. The students of free culture met there. They were discussing a lot of open issues. They invited Larry Lessig, they invited other activists, and they did something that I remember a couple of days ago somebody mentioned, I attended an unconference. I don't know if you ever attended one of these unconferences, but these unconferences that, well, there is no program. You just set the program and there are, you start to put posts everywhere and with the posts you decided what you want to talk about. So these are students for the free culture that in fact were the ones who started the Open Access Day also, they had different chapters all over the US. So the, the chapter of Berkeley, they decided to discuss about the Open University Project. So they were thinking, well, we have the Budapest Open Access in, uh, in, Initiative, we have the Open Courseware, we have a lot of things. So why we don't think about openness in a more holistic, a more global way, and to discuss about what, is, what could be an open university. So they were deciding, well, we have to define an open access campaign. Well, they were saying, no, open university. We have to uh, get everyone at the university to open courses. Well, they decided to have non-controversial points. We need actionable items. We support access to information, info commons. We need campaigns for open access. Also a campaign about access to medicine. We, we are against censorship on the uh, net, more access, etc. And all these discussions ended in this blackboard that I used many times in, this, in my talks. So uh, since 2008, I've been using this picture from Fred, Fred Benenson because I think it's a good starting if you want to discuss about how open is your institution. 
These students there in Berkeley, they decided to have five criteria, the criteria that are there in the blackboard. And they start the Open University campaign, a campaign that probably was a failure because nobody of you and I have ever heard about that. But for me, it was really inspiring because since then, I be, I, I've done a lot of work to have the university more open in a broad sense. So the five criteria, I want to review with you the five criteria. The, the first one is the research the university produces is open access. If you go to the page, it's still there, and you don't have to go to the Wayback Machine. This open university campaign is there. And of course, with this statement, there is a lot to discuss, what it means research, what it means open access. So we can discuss about, well, it includes publications, it includes other things. The course materials are open educational resources, again. What is a course material? What is open educational resources? You can click there and you will have some definitions that they agreed on and they were saying, well, let's follow this or the other definition. The university embraces free software and open standards. I always say it's good to embrace free software, but not just as a user. If we are a community, if you embrace free software, is that you have to belong to the community and to share and to bring something to the community. If the university holds patents, it readily licenses them for free software, essential medicines, and the public good. Well, this is a very controversial, the patents, we have a lot of problems at the university dealing with patents. We even in Creative Commons had like many times discussions about do we need a tool like the Creative Commons license for patenting? Or we need like pleas of I'm not using these patents against this and this. Well. There is an, a never-ending story, and we never had a solution. But I understand that in the US, you had a really big discussion about this bailed all act that was, was enacting there about the patenting. And that's why these students were really worried about patenting and open the patenting for software, essential medicines, and the public good. And finally, the university network reflects the open nature of internet. Well, my the people who who lives here in Barcelona and in Spain, you know that a few weeks ago, the government uh, just passed, not a law, just a decree to censorship the internet again. So it's not just a question of the university, it's a question of civil rights. And I think it's very dangerous that the power thinks that if you cut the internet, they will all will follow them. So it's very dangerous. I think this point, we always forget about this point. And when they were talking about university, and I think that's the important of the declaration, is that it's not a, something like on the top. University includes all the community. So university is students, it's faculty, and it's administration. So when they say the university embraces free software, it's students, faculty, and administration embraces free software. When they say, uh, Course materials, it means students, faculty, administration, and etc. So at that time, I was in this project called Comunia. Comunia was a network in Europe for the digital public domain, another thing that is threatening many times for the copyright. Uh, someone was mentioning during these days how the extension, I think, uh, Rory was mentioning this morning about the extension of the, di of the copyright and how the digital public domain is always threatened. There was just the news yesterday about how a museum was trying to put copyright on a reproduction of an Afertari uh, head. Imagine, again, a copyright on that, that's incredible. So we, we made this network to defend, especially the digital public domain. And now we have a directive in Europe that says that if you digitize something that is in the public domain, that digital copy, it's not a work, it's a digital copy, must remain in the public domain. And that's a message that has to be clear for museums, for libraries, for archives, and for museums. So I was there in Comunia, and I was leading the work package on education and on research. And we were thinking that maybe we could use the Wheeler Declaration to have a survey in Europe about how open were our universities. That was the idea. The ultimate vision is to promote openness in multiple aspects of universities and other institutions of higher education. 
I have to confess that uh, I was before in a in, a, in one of the sessions that somebody said, oh, we only received 37 uh, answers. Noelia, you are there. Uh, well, that was the more depressing. We only received, uh, I don't know, less than 10. And they were all my colleagues from the Catalan universities that, of course, they were answering these ones. But it was a pity. And, well, I was keep trying. I mean, I even, I even went to, to Leuven to a discussion about curating the European University. And I, I, and I had my small a contribution there. What is the meaning of openness for the universities? Because I think it, it's something that we have to discuss, and we haven't yet discussed it. So my question now, and I'm not going to do a survey now, we just keep it for the weekend. Is it still suitable, that declaration, that criteria? It's enough to have these five criteria to define an open university nowadays? You have the five criteria. I mean, the, you can find it is online, and you can have the slides for sure online. But maybe we must to update that five criteria, or maybe to expand, or maybe to modify things. Of course, at that time there was not a big discussion about data, but maybe we have to th to think. Maybe if we want to be open, we have to think about our data, and maybe we could add something like data the university produces is fair and open by default. And I expressly didn't put research data, because I think it's not just research data. It's even the data that university makes, uh, creates, has. I, I always say to my colleagues in the library, we have to share our data, and we do that. Because I cannot go to a researcher and say, you must share your data, unless you already share, are sharing your data. So I think all the university should sh share more data and open by default. Infrastructures, maybe we have to say something about infrastructures if we want to be more open. Maybe we have to say something like university participates and supports open infrastructures, and it has been said all this morning, led and governed by the community. Well, we can have this or other kinds, and then we can link and define what is led and governed by the community. We have initiatives like that. I mean, I remember this morning, Kathy already mentioned Invest in Open Infrastructure. We also have, uh, supported by Spark Europe, the SCOS. And I'm asking here how many Spanish institutions are supporting these initiatives. Because we have to think about that. We, we like that everything is free, but we not contribute to that. And it's something, I'm throwing stones to my own institution, I know. But since I'm not director, I can do it. <laughs> what about evaluation? That's the other thing, that's the other topic. We always say, well, you know, all these things would be impossible if we don't change the evaluation, if we don't change assessment. So maybe we have to do something like the university has a clear evaluation criteria that consider the value and the impact of any kind of outputs and activities. And this is an adaptation of some of the sentences that you find in the Declaration on Research Assessment, the known as the San Francisco Declaration. Yet another declaration. I don't know if in that list that Catherine showed of, of uh, Girona and Bianca, where there were more than 100 principles, if you have all these declarations there, sure they are there. Or we can use also the, the Leiden Manifesto that I think have uh, 10 really interesting points to discuss on that. Integrity. Of course, we have to also think about integrity. It's one of the points of the pillars of the open science. And maybe we need something like we have a research integrity code which embraces open science principles. And I took this from the roadmap that I co-authored with other colleagues in the LIRU, the League of European Research Universities, a roadmap for open science in, uh, for the universities. And of course we can keep discussing and keep thinking about the ideas like responsible research and innovation, public engagement. I like more this idea of public engagement uh, instead of citizen science, because sometimes citizen science get reduced to, well, you know, I have this app, I ask the citizens to download the app and go with the mobile phone, get the data, and send it back to me. Well, this is not really the idea of the citizen science. So that's why I sometimes use more the public engagement, uh, society and knowledge, things like that. That is like, we have to go out, but we also have to uh, allow people to come in and to discuss with us. It's not like we, we know everything and we have to explain that. It's that they know more than us and they, they have to talk with us. And of course we have to include, and do not forget values, 
like the ones that were mentioning, mentioned yesterday by Tara, accessibility, diversity, equity, inclusivity, and more that I forget. Wow, I, I don't know what happened with this presentation in PDF, but anyway, this is, this is that the open, the, the open university is something that, well, it happened in, Will, in the Wheeler Declaration, but this is a, an, an, a, a, a paper from Erin McKiernan, an activist, a researcher, and very activist, and many of you know, know her, and she was already had a, pure, a, 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 a preprint talking about how do you imagine an open university. And reading that preprint, you can see that some of the discussions that I was proposing here are on the same direction, are aligned. It's a pity that Erin didn't mention the Wheeler Declaration. I would like to just have like a, a line, like, oh, there were someone already mentioning that. And also, there is another discussion going on. Uh, this group of people where you have Lucy Montgomery, but also Cam Cameron Nalon, that was mentioned also a few times this morning, have this discussion about the open knowledge institutions reinventing universities. I really uh, recommend you to read the article and have a look at this book, because if you work in a university, I think it's worth to read it and to think about that we really need a cultural change. And you, what you can do to contribute to an open university? Because it's always the same. Well, the university will change. It will, well, it will never change if we don't do things. And of course, we can just think in about what Eva Mendez, the chair of the Open Science Policy Platform, and this is just a, a, a sketch of her talk last Tuesday. Well, Eva Mendez always say, well, we can just, I mean, you can make the, the wish list. I want this, I want that. But look at this slide and you will see the, what she calls the practical commitment implementation. So change declarations to implementations. As we did many, uh, three years ago in Amsterdam, we said uh, we make a call for action. So we probably should get rid of uh, more declarations and get for more implementations. And the practical commitments for implementation is what you can do to change that. Just commit to things that you can do. If you cannot change the open access policy of the university, don't think that you, that's something that we have to do. Do the changes yourself, and then everybody could commit of the things that they could do. You can share, share, and share, and be as open as possible. Open by default. I always say I will be happy the day I have to justify what I close. And you can change text, any kind of text you write. You can change data, any kind of, of, of data you, you do, code, images, presentations, whatever you do. And please, don't forget the license. Because if you forget the license, it's all rights reserved. I'm crazy about the license, you know, but I can, can, can copy it. And please, at the end, engage with the community. You have your community, or maybe you have more than one community. Engage with the community, and then we could have all the different stakeholders, all the different people. And I want to end with this, what we call La Piña. Okay, that's why I was saying that it was already being used. Well, I'm not showing the castle. I'm showing the, the people who is down there. And I wanted to show this picture because as you could, as you could see, the, the groups that make those castles always, always are wearing the same color. But if you look at this picture, you see a lot of colors because that's the way they do things. I mean, there are more than one group doing the castles, but when they need people, they bring all the people from different parts. That's the diversity because if we want to reach the final goal, we need all of you. Thank you very much.